when everything around us is just out of control, it seems like spinning out of control with no end, Lord. We thank you that you can bring clarity to us, Lord, and that focus. We pray for those who don't know, who don't know that hope, Lord. Just pray that today will be the day that you would just give them that peace, Lord, that only comes from looking at you, Lord, and knowing you. So would you bless this message and the time together, Lord? Would you speak to us, Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Good morning and welcome. You can be seated. Thank you. I want to welcome those of you that are joining us online. We're so very glad that you are. This is our first of two services on Sunday morning, which is devoted to the weekly Bible prophecy update. Uh, second service which will be at 11.15 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time, that'll be live streamed as well, is our verse by verse study through the Bible. We're currently in 1 John, the third chapter. And today we're going to look at why it is that the fruit from my life will always expose what's at the root of my life. Got a catch to it, yeah? Nice title. Just humor me. Tell me it's a nice title. Uh, those of you that are watching by way of YouTube and Facebook, um, you might want to go directly to the website at jdfrog.org, because at some point we'll end the live stream. And uh, there you'll find the uninterrupted and uncensored entirety of today's update. So with that, let's get started. What I want to talk with you about today is what I'm going to affectionately refer to as one having a pre-trib rapture preparedness. And the reason I'm choosing this title and topic is because whether we realize it or not, we are being prepared. And even in some cases programmed, dare I say, it's not really a matter of if we're being prepared. It's more a question of are we prepared for what's being prepared. I know this might come off as maybe an oversimplification, but I'll say it nonetheless. We're either prepared by the world, for the world, or we're prepared to be taken out of the world. And this by way of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, which I will never shrink back from. I don't care who says what about that. I will never cower or falter or be intimidated by anybody that says, you're so dogmatic about the pre-tribulation rapture. <laughs> I needed to get that off my chest right out of the shoe. But the pre-tribulation rapture is when we who are alive and remain are caught up to meet the Lord in the air as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 in my Bible says. But the sad truth is that the masses, including professing Christians, <laughs> are actually being ready for the tribulation coming upon the world and not the pre-trib rapture when we're taken out of the world. And that's just the fact of the matter, sadly. Even sadder, not only are many Christians not prepared for our soon departure in the rapture, they, along with others, including some pastors and teachers, demean those, belittle those who dare to believe that the rapture of the church, the pre-trib rapture of the church can happen like right now. 
<laughs> it was just checking. It's actually even worse than that. I want to get this out of the way. So, but it's worse than that, because teachers of Bible prophecy are joining in and piling on anyone who dares to suggest that we don't have decades before the rapture could happen. We are that generation. But anybody who, who dares to say that, you're a date setter. Stop. Just stop. I, I didn't realize I'm so upset already, and I, we haven't even started. I, let me try to calm down. I, Lord, I'm sorry. Just help me. Actually, I, I, I'm, I'm going to share with you <laughs> a most interesting email that we received a couple of days ago. I'm going to share some portions of this email with you. Um, it speaks to this exact issue. I mean, I have been struggling personally, and we get this email, and I'm like, Lord, thank you. You knew I needed someone to email this to me. So I want to share it with you. Good day, Pastor JD. I follow you online from Trinidad in the Caribbean. Today, however, I would like to spell out very plainly yet another reason why I appreciate your ministry. A pastor, while he seemed concerned about the harm caused by date setting, had an attitude towards those among us who are excited about Christ's return, and it was very discouraging. He said of these brethren that their eschatology lacked scholarship and academia, and that they should not try to teach Hebrew and Greek, because they are so far from a proper knowledge of these languages. <laughs> I didn't write this, okay, just so you know. I could have, maybe not as well, but I've been struggling with this, and she's hitting the proverbial nail on the head, because there seems to be this, I'll use her word, attitude on the part of some who possess certain academic credentials have a proper understanding of the original Hebrew and Greek language, are biblically qualified in their scholarship, that have sort of banded together now and teamed up on and piled up on brothers and sisters in Christ who are going, hey, yeah, but where are your degrees? Where are the letters after your name? I don't have any. So I changed my name. I just put the letters in front of my name, JD, <laughs> which stands for Jesus' disciple, by the way. Reminds me of the Apostle Paul. I'll get back to the email. Just bear with me. But it reminds me of the Apostle Paul when he writes to the Corinthians in his first letter. By the time he get, to, I mean, just at the beginning, by the time he gets to the second chapter, he writes about how that he did not come to them seeking to impress them with his intellect. He did not come to persuade them with the eloquence of his speech. Rather, he came to preach Jesus and Him crucified. And here's a guy that by any standard, I mean pretty impressive, and he could assert, I would have, which is why God probably never allowed me to ever further my education. I barely graduated high school. I'm not proud of that, but I just think that God still chooses to use 
the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and the weak to shame the strong. Nothing wrong with that, except that when that becomes the credential, the authentic, authentication, the validation, and there's this superiority like, well, who are you? You're a nobody. Well, last time I checked, God uses nobodies. I love how one said it, you're not in the who's who. Well, I'm in the who's he. <laughs> this is a problem. And I'm going to just hit it head on, because I see it getting worse. So she's just sharing her heart with me about her struggle with this idea that you have to have eschatological scholarship and knowledge of the Greek and Hebrew, and you have to have the academic credentials to be able to even teach Bible prophecy. Quoting the email again, very well written, he did not have to call the names of the brethren he was levying his attack on. I was so disheartened to hear him speak this way. I know I'm no theologian and am not a graduate of any cemetery, actually seminary. She didn't say cemetery. I added that. But of late, I've taken a position to be somewhat of a watcher because of what I observe where I am. But after hearing him, I doubted whether I should even desire or pursue such a course. After all, I do not know Hebrew or Greek, but I can surely make a good go at researching the Scriptures. Oh, does it make me less worthy to, and this makes me want to cry, does it make me less worthy to labor in the vineyard because I am not as learnt as he or they? Sometimes I wonder if brothers like this and such likes are angry more at the fact that these brethren are revealing information that they did not have years ago, especially since some of them have many books out there about end time prophecies and what they felt were signs of the times. Now they know that they were wrong. And it seems to me that they're still trying to justify their positions from years before. That position is just as damaging as the brothers he's accusing. He did not seem too kind, in my opinion, not very gracious, almost not embracing them as brethren in the Lord. Before I found your ministry two years ago, it was these preachers I was listening to, and it was exactly this effect their preaching had on me. They did not call a specific date, but they did not need to. And I made some very important decisions based on what they taught, and they puzzled me too. I, I heard them planning for things way into the future, while delivering these powerful sermons of Christ's soon return. Then I listened to some of their conferences and was left puzzled and even angry. People ask questions like, is the Antichrist alive today? Or how long after the rapture would the tribulation begin? Or how long before the rapture happens? Here's one answer. We don't know if the Antichrist is alive. M my brain can't make sense of this. The rapture could happen any time, but the tribulation could begin months, years, or even 50 years from now. These same preachers use John 14 to prove the rapture, making reference to a Galilean wedding. 
When the scriptures tell us that when we see certain things begin to happen, look up for your redemption draweth near. Where do these two examples fit in with an answer as stated earlier? They do confuse me greatly. Then with respect to when the rapture will occur, I have actually heard one of them in an interview say, it could be as much as 50 years from now. Imagine that. I'm like you, Pastor. I love you. <laughs> I feel sorry for you, but if you're like me. But she goes on to write, there goes my blessed hope. These preachers say that even though everything is lining up, God could make it play out for as long as 50 years more, because we do not know the day or the hour. They think that they are innocent, but they are not. They have robbed me of the joy of my blessed hope, all the anticipation and so forth from watching so many other good brothers in the Lord. It does take its toll because they seem to be seasoned prophecy watchers on the block, talking in this manner. And some seem to have hinged so much on scholarship and education and academia that I wonder what place the Scripture has in this thinking, when it tells us that we have an unction from the Holy Spirit, so that we need not that any should teach us. That was First Peter, or uh, yeah, First Peter, or uh, First John. We just got done. Uh, that is pretty bad when the pastor doesn't remember what he preached on. We just talked about this: the unction from the Holy Spirit that gives you discernment. But he, here's this precious sister in the Lord going, oh, I guess I have to listen to them, because they're the authority now. Because they have the academic credentials now. They have the scholarship now. So I guess I don't need the Holy Spirit or the Oh, I don't need the, the Scriptures, because apparently I can just go to them, and they'll interpret it for me, instead of me. Hmm. Studying is important, but to project that it is only the formally trained should have a voice is humiliating. Still, we are Christ's. Not so? You know what she's saying here? She's saying, I'm, I'm just a nobody that loves Jesus, and I'm watching for His soon return, as I'm told in the Scriptures I should. And I'm watching, and I'm discerning the times, and I'm understanding the times, and I know like the men of Issachar what I need to do. And I, and I happen to know a couple of verses, no, not like you. <laughs> but I, if I go to the Scriptures, I, 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 that's the final authority. The reason I wanted to start out this way and share this with you is because we're exhorted in Scripture, as this sister so eloquently and passionately writes, to be at the ready in our expectation of the rapture at any time. Paul was. 2,000 years ago, we who were alive and remain. Uh, every generation has, by God's design, thought that the rapture could happen in their lifetime. And it could have. And they were ready. And they weren't Greek and Hebrew scholars. 
They were not theologians. And you don't need to be a Greek or Hebrew scholar or theologian to know that the end is not near. The end is here. Ah, one more thing before I turn this next corner. I wonder sometimes if it's not the opposite that's true. Stay with me, hear me out. For those of you who see me as your pastor, which I'm profoundly privileged to be, you understand that I stand before you, as is my privilege to every week, as one who has no formal education. Again, nothing wrong with that. I have no Greek or Hebrew scholarship. I can speak a little bit of Arabic. I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, I'm just somebody that God looked at and thought, you know, I could probably use a guy like that. Yeah, but here's the heavenly host going. He doesn't even, he, not only does he not have an impressive resume, he actually doesn't even have a resume. I know. Yeah, but him? Come on, you can, you can do better than that. Actually, I'm going to use somebody like that, because then they will know it's not him. Because look at him. <laughs> I can't, I can't stand before you and give any credit to my credentials. Yeah. Paul says, the reason I didn't come to you with my crushing intellect, which he possessed, my persuasive speech, which he possessed, the reason I didn't come to you, I could have, but I didn't. You want to know why? That way you would know is the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, and God's Word, not my intellect. So when you walk away, you're going, wow, if God could use somebody like that, there's hope for me. Because again, I'm pretty sure it's still there. You can look it up after the prophecy update, but God does choose the foolish to confound the wise, so that He alone gets the glory. I think of David. One last thing. He's not even in the lineup. Are you kidding me? Here comes Samuel. He's got the Urim, the Thummim. He's ready to anoint the next king of Israel to succeed Saul, from whom the kingdom has been taken away. He shows up. Seven young, built, buffed, work out every day at 24-hour fitness, especially the oldest brother, Eliab. And in that culture to this day, the firstborn, that's the one, the heir apparent. Surely Eliab is the next king of Israel. Can you picture them standing there? Iliab looking at those other brothers going, you know it's me. I don't even know why you're bothering. So here comes Samuel. And even Samuel is baffled. It's like, it's not you. Iliab's going, I, d here, try again. No, it's not you. And then by age, he goes down the list. Seven brothers, none of them. He is flabbergasted. He says to Jesse, uh, the father, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't pull the wrong file here. You have, you have another son? Oh yeah, but come on, he's, he's the youngest. Where is he? Well, he's out, oh, tending to the sheep. Well, go get him. And nobody sits down, has a cup of coffee until he gets here. So could you imagine the surprise on David's face when they come out and they get him and said, hey, the prophet Samuel's there and he, he's asking for you. Me? Yeah, you. You're talking to me? 
Yeah, you. So we're told the detail. I love it. God's got a sense of humor. A little ruddy, you know. He's a teenager. Smells like sheep. Comes in from the sheep that he's been tending. And, you know, could you imagine? I, I, I know that I think like this. Just pray for me, because I picture it. Layup going. I mean, his the body language. Here, here walks up David. What? Samuel, it's him. The brothers. What? Dad, no way. Even David's probably going. Okay, well. My heart is after God's own heart. I am His to do with as He pleases. And then Samuel is even, and we're talking the prophet Samuel here, okay? The Lord has to like pull him aside, just say, hey, Sam, Sammy, get over here. We're going to talk. I know you're, you're blown away here. <laughs> yeah, you think? Well, let me explain something to you. Man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. I think about when King Asa is sent this prophecy from the prophet on the heels of a victory over a one million man army of the Ethiopians. And the prophet prophesies to him and says, don't you know that the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth, looking for hearts fully devoted to Him, so that He could be strong on their behalf? So just kind of picture this. Use your God-given imagination and picture God doing a search. I'm looking for somebody. Oh, can't use him. Ooh. He thinks more highly of himself than he ought. And if I even tried to, well, he would certainly take all the credit for it. And everybody would be more than happy to give him all the credit for it. After all, look at his credentials. No wonder. Nah, I think I'll choose that guy. It's laughable. So that when I find a heart that is after my own heart, fully devoted to me, fully depending on me, fully relying on me, fully committed to me, now we're talking. I'm going to use him. Yeah, but he's not even a pastor. I know. Oh, he's, all he's got is a YouTube channel. I know. But I can use somebody like that. Yeah, but he hasn't written any books. That's actually going to seal the deal for me. That's the guy I'm going to use, because he's not going to be selling books at the table out front afterwards. Nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that they have fancied themselves now as being the experts. So that if God should happen to choose a David to use, the problem isn't that God's going to choose to use a David. The problem is when these other guys who have all of the credentials are not. And they cross the line when with that scholarship and academia and knowledge and theology and all of the above, they start looking down on and piling on and are condescending of and belittling of and dismissive of the guy that God chooses to use. Are we okay? So you've got a group of people now that God in His sovereignty, in His grace, has in His search found to choose and use that 
baffle the minds of all the experts. And they're actually daring to say, I think we're out of here. And this is the direction I want to go, and it's for this reason that I'm going in this direction. And what I want to do is build upon a detailed account in the book of Exodus, namely that of the departure preparedness, as it were, when the Israelites had to be at the ready to leave Egypt in haste. They started up YouTube channels there in Egypt. And they were doing these podcasts, and they were, they were saying, hey, th this is it. This is it. We need to be ready. Enter Exodus chapter 12, replete with typology concerning Jesus as the fulfillment of the Passover prophecy. I want to draw your attention to the specific details as it relates to the urgency and haste with which the Israelites had to be ready at any moment. No, no hurry. We got 50 years. No, no, no. Come back. Come back. Exodus 12. No, this is it. This is it. I want to kind of, by way of an introduction, this is only the introduction, Pastor? Well, not really, but we're, we're, we'll get there. It's going to be germane to our understanding of what the Spirit is saying to us as the church today, for those who have ears to hear and hearts to receive. Behold, I come quickly. This is in the verse 11, Exodus 12. Now, you understand the Passover. I'm not going to go into it, nor do I have the time to. But that tenth plague, the angel of death would pass over if they had the blood of the lamb in the shape of a cross on the doorpost. They would be saved, and the angel of death would pass over them, a prophecy that would be fulfilled by the person of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Okay? Now, the Israelites are about to be taken out in haste of Egypt. N no time. We don't have time. You don't have 50 years. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, ready to go, your sandals on your feet. We call them slippers. Don't call them flip-flop. I, I did that. Never call in Hawaii slippers flip-flop. You'll get flip-flopped if you do. <laughs> I mean, you got your slippers on and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. There's no time. Why? It is the Lord's Passover. It's time. This is happening. We're doing this. Verses 33 and 34, Exodus 12. And the, <laughs> the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. Hang on to that word haste. I, I really like this word haste in this context. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, no time, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. We're ready. We're ready to go. Good. In haste. Right. No time. I know. That's why. Verse 39, And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because, here's why, listen please very carefully, they were driven out of Egypt, can I say taken out of Egypt, and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Why is that? Because it happened so fast. Oh, I thought I had 50 years to prepare for pre provisions for this. No, no time. Oh, I, th I, thought, I thought we had time we could wait for. No, and could not wait. No time to prepare the provisions, because I'm taking you out in haste, in haste, suddenly, quickly, 
Now. Now. Just checking again. Just checking. Pastor, where are you going with this? Just as the Israelites left Egypt in haste, not even preparing provisions, so too is this true for us. In other words, there had to be an urgency and a preparedness to leave in haste from Egypt, which in typology the world is a picture of Egypt. And just as Israel was taken out of Egypt with haste, so too will we be taken out of this world in the pre-trib rapture with haste. There's no time. There's no time. Now we still have a problem. What's the problem? The problem is that many Christians today do not possess this urgency. And as such, they're not preparing with haste for the pre-tribulation rapture. And this for several reasons, not the least of which is that they still think that we have time. I wrote a book a couple years ago, so it can't happen right now, because then I have to go back and rewrite that book, or take and edit it, or something, because we still have time, because this has to happen, that has to No, it doesn't. Well, according to the Greek and the Hebrew, no, that's, 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 no. Oh, have you seen my credentials? Yeah, it's okay. it's okay. I don't need to see them. I know that you've got them framed huge on your wall in your office to, for on display. You dust them off every day. <laughs> if this weren't bad enough, instead of a pre-tribulation rapture preparedness, many are actually focused on the next pandemic preparedness. Why is that, you ask? Well, it's because many buy the lie with the prolific and powerful propaganda that's fed to the masses in ways never before known. It's the likes of which we have never seen before, nor will we ever see again. I, yeah, I better not now. I'll wait. Um, I want to expound on this. Specifically, why do people buy the lie? Why is it so prevalent and pronounced? And even amongst Christians, and even amongst prophecy teachers. Well, I want to talk about that for the remainder of our time. So we're going to go ahead and end the live stream at this time.